Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for the invitation to TEDx IIT Lucknow. It's a pleasure to be here and tell you a little bit about this exciting new area of research called quantum computing. Now, medicines are everywhere. Some people love them, others hate them. But there's no denying that they play a very useful low role in modern society, in helping alleviate pain, curing diseases, and in general giving us a better quality of life. But everything is not always rosy. Sometimes medicines have side effects. You can't take one medicine with another medicine. And in some cases, medicines don't exist at all for some diseases. So one wonders, even though development of new medicines is very hard, we have powerful computers at our disposal. And we do all kinds of tests on these computers. So can we not use computers to understand how medicines work better? Let's look at this medicine, aspirin. Looks pretty simple. It has about nine carbon atoms, eight hydrogen atoms, and four oxygen atoms. That's not a lot. But it turns out that the underlying physics behind the behavior of atoms and molecules is so hard that even the most powerful computers cannot handle them. And the reason is the underlying physics is called quantum mechanics. And it's different than what we call classical mechanics, which is the physics which explains how things work in daily life. Atoms and molecules don't work like cricket balls or footballs. And we'll see why. Before we get into quantum mechanics, let's just talk about regular computing. Now, we use numbers. We use the decimal system. There are 10 of them. We can add, subtract, and do all kinds of manipulations with these numbers. But it turns out that for machines, it's better to use a number system which only has two possibilities, just two numerals, 0 and 1. This is called a binary digit, or a bit, and it's the backbone of all modern computation. Now, this bit has to be stored in some way. For example, on a CD, if you zoom in, you can see that there are all these dark and bright patches, and they represent the zeros and the one. So you need a different physical property to represent them. And this way of storing and processing information is extremely powerful. As we all know and use laptops, smartphones, which hopefully a lot of you have in silent mode, they have been getting more and more powerful as the years go by. And we have been able to do amazing things with them. Yet, they are not good for solving the kind of problem I just discussed. That is understanding the quantum mechanical properties of atoms and molecules. Why is that? So we need to enter the quantum world to understand it. Now, quantum mechanics is usually the physics which explains how things work in the atomic world. That is atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons. An atom, as we learn often in high school, is supposed to have a nucleus in the middle and these electrons going around them. We often imagine this to be like a little solar system with the sun in the middle and the planets going around them. It turns out that this description is actually quite inaccurate. In the correct description of quantum mechanics, you cannot really say where the electron is. The underlying equations allow you to calculate the probability of finding the electron somewhere. But you cannot really say where it is at a particular point of time. It's just how it works. The electron also has another property called the spin. And that makes it behave like a little magnet, a little bar magnet, which has a north pole and a south pole. And we can use that to represent a bit. A magnet pointing in one direction can be called zero. And the magnet pointing in another direction can be called one. Now, in that sense, this is no different than the classical bit we discussed a little while back. But because this is a quantum system, the electron spin behaves the laws of quantum mechanics. It offers a lot more. And to understand that, we need to look at the different possible quantum states you can have. And the way to understand it is to look at a globe. 
on this globe, the North Pole and the South Pole correspond to zero and one of the two possibilities of a bit. But in addition, you have all these other points on the surface of the globe. So for example, if you're in the equator, then the way we describe this state is as if it's both zero and one at the same time. This is called a quantum superposition of zero and one. It does not have a well-defined property till you to decide to measure it. And that's where the second strange aspect of quantum mechanics comes in. Even though there are infinite number of possibilities on this globe, when you try to detect, the answer is still zero or one. Infinite ways of preparing the state, but only two possible answers when you detect them. So how is this really useful in computing? If you now take one qubit or a quantum bit, as I said, there are two possibilities and you can prepare the system in both at the same time. You go to two qubits and just like two bits, there are now four possible numbers, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. But the difference is that in the quantum world, I can prepare it with all the four possibilities at the same time. Two possibilities for one qubit, four possibilities for two qubits. If you now go to something like 300 qubits, that's not a lot. The smartphones in your pocket have more than one billion bits easily. I'm only talking about 300 qubits. But what is the number of combinations that is possible with 300 qubits? That number is two followed by 90 zeros. It's a huge number. In fact, it's so huge that it's approximately the number of atoms in the entire visible universe. Remember, it's still only 300 qubits. It's just that these huge number of possibilities can exist simultaneously, as opposed to a 300-bit conventional system where you can only have one of those possibilities. It's this access to the enormous number of states which gives quantum computing its power. How can we actually use this? Here's a picture of what's called a phone book or a telephone directory. Now this audience is quite young, so probably most of you have never seen this, but this used to be in every home. It lists all the phone numbers and the names of people, say, living in a city or a town. And it's sorted alphabetically so that if someone gives you a name, it's easy to find it in the book. But what if I gave you a phone number and I asked you to find out who does it belong to? There is no efficient way of doing this. The only way you can do is to just look through all the pages. If you're lucky, you might find it on the first page. If you're unlucky, it will be the last page you will ever look. Mathematically speaking, if there are n numbers stored in this book, you have to roughly look at half of them before you find it. Love Grower, a scientist working in Bell Labs in the 90s, figured out that if one uses a quantum version of a program to look at this problem, you can actually do something quite different. In some sense, you can look at all the pages at the same time. It comes from the same idea that you can prepare the quantum system in all of these possibilities at the same time. Now, it looks like in this method, I should be able to find it in one shot, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. And it turns out that if you have n numbers, instead of having to look at n by two, or half of them, you have to only look at square root of n, which means if you had 100 numbers, you have to look at only 10 of them as opposed to 50 in the conventional method. If you had a million numbers, you have to look at only 1,000 of them as opposed to half a million. So you see that as the numbers grow, the difference between the quantum version and the classical version changes dramatically, and the power of quantum computing manifests itself. What else can we do with this? When we do a credit card transaction on the internet, the credit card numbers are encrypted in such a way that if someone is trying to steal the information, it's very difficult for them to do. In fact, almost impossible. It relies on a mathematical complexity of a certain problem, which prevents you from cracking the code and discovering the 
secret information. But again, in the 90s, a scientist by the name Peter Shore showed that if you had a quantum computer which uses the laws of quantum mechanics, then you can solve this problem in a matter of minutes or seconds. Something which was impossible is now possible. Financial markets, transportation, logistics, routing, the traveling salesman problem. The delivery guy has to deliver 100 packages. What is the most efficient route to take so that he saves fuel? This is an inherently complex problem for conventional computers. But quantum computers might provide a way to solve these problems more efficiently and a lot more quicker. As I discussed earlier, solving for the properties of atoms and molecules, which can give rise to new medicines, better medicines, cleaner fuels, more energy efficient batteries. This is now possible a lot more efficiently using quantum computers. And the reason is the computer uses the same laws of physics that is underlying the behavior of these systems. And finally, even the very complicated problem of predicting the weather accurately can be helped by using quantum algorithms. All of these problems have an underlying feature that there are many, many possibilities to be explored. And because you can prepare this quantum system in all these different possibilities at the same time and explore them in parallel, that's where the power comes from. And apart from this, there might be many more applications which we are still not aware of. Scientists are working to discover what those might be. So where are we right now with this technology? I'm showing here an image which looks a little garbled. Can you recognize what's in this image? It's the famous actress, Marilyn Monroe. But you can barely make out, and it's garbled because the bits, the zeros and ones which are used to store this image have gotten changed. Some zeros have become one, and some ones have become zero. And when that happens, information gets lost. If you have satellite TV in your house and it's a rainy day, sometimes you see the image gets all garbled. It's the same reason. Some zeros are becoming one, and some ones are becoming zero randomly. Now, something similar happens in the quantum system, but the problem is much worse. Remember that the quantum state can be anywhere on the surface of the sphere. So if you started on the equator, you would ideally like it to stay in that position if you want to preserve that information. But what tends to happen is that this state starts to wander randomly all over the place. So after some point of time, you do have completely lost the original information. And the worst part is that this happens very, very quickly for most quantum systems. They are inherently unstable. So does that mean that we cannot do anything about it? Luckily, there is a solution. Scientists figured out that if you actually use several of them, then it is possible to preserve the information even if individually they are doing this random walk. This is the idea behind a technique called quantum error correction. And it is a very important milestone in this technology, which is yet to be achieved. So what do these machines actually look like? Here's a picture of one type of a quantum computer. What you are seeing, those blue dots, are individual atoms which are suspended in free space. Each one of them represents one qubit. And in this image, there are about 70 of them. You obviously want to use things like atoms because they obey the same quantum mechanical laws. But people have figured out that it's actually possible to make electronic chips just like the ones in your phone or your laptop, which also show quantum mechanical behavior. Here's an example from about maybe 15 years ago, a chip showing only two qubits. More recently, a chip showing about nine qubits. Now these electronic circuits, which is the area of my research, have to operate under the right conditions to display the quantum mechanical behavior. The ones in your phones don't. These ones have to be cooled in specialized machines like this, which cool the device to extremely low temperatures. Temperatures close to absolute zero. Temperatures colder than outer space. And it's only under those conditions that this random walk I was telling you that the quantum systems like to do, they get minimized. And then you can hope to do something. But none of these machines today implement the idea of quantum error correction. There are chips with about 72 qubits announced by Google a couple of years ago. 
IBM has a 50 qubit quantum processor, but they are still prone to errors, which means that if you run them for too long, the answer you will get will be incorrect. Yet, we have been able to show that the basic ideas behind quantum computing works. There is still a lot of work to be done. We have to reduce these errors. We have to figure out how to do this error correction so that the errors don't matter. And only then we'll be able to realize all the wonderful applications I mentioned a little while back. Scientists all over the world are working very, very hard on this problem. In India, the work started about five to six years ago, where it really started taking some pace up. And more recently, the government has realized that this is a very important technology for the future. And it's going to announce new programs to support and make the research in this area a lot bigger and a lot faster. And hopefully, we will be making practical devices soon. We're actually at the cusp of a very important milestone when we show that for a particular problem, only a quantum computer can solve it. And even the most powerful computer on Earth today is not going to be able to, be able to solve it. And we are very close to achieving that. And once that happens, it will really pave the way for developing machines which are able to do all the wonderful things I mentioned. Thank you.